Johan Aerst, I think about two years ago, from uh, the organization Gluon, in collaboration with uh, Bozar Lab, to work with a couple of scientists upon the idea of a visual. I mean, I came up with the idea to work with Luke Stales because I knew Luke Stales from before and I know his groundbreaking work, that the groundbreaking work he made already for the last, well, ne nearly 40 years, which is mostly about semantics and about the idea of language. And uh, I thought it would be interesting to make a sort of research starting from the visual and actually see what artificial intelligence and algorithms actually could produce out of that. Of course, we immediately decided uh, not to make a painting with a computer. The research had to go deeper, I mean, and if we talk about artificial intelligence, it's also the meaning of it is, of course, that through the semantics of it and through the idea of how it develops itself is how a thought process is actually accumulated. This transplanted, of course, on the visual. The very first question was, in how far is the algorithm capable of retracing the image, the original image, the source image, which proved to be a bit more complicated than we thought. The interesting thing that I also find uh, interesting is to see, because I mean with language and semantics, it's, I mean, and if you have a title or it refers to something, then it becomes clear and of course then the, very soon you will see the source material, but in this case it was much more ambiguous because the image was altered. And so uh, it became much more an idea of what can the algorithms actually mean in terms of the signifier, in terms of what something means. And in effect, uh, the point where we at, are at now, you will see that there is nearly an endless escape of all the sort of uh, associations that come up, just for one, from an image in a sense. Where we're at now is that we can actually, I mean, because Luc made a very thorough uh, and rather arbitrary, but very thorough investigation into all uh, several images of which this is one, where you can see how the image is perceived through artificial intelligence. What is important if you, and you will see that in the show also, that at a certain point where the because I, but there was also the, the idea from, to ask the artificial intelligence on what it would focus within an image. So as a person would look at a particular image, where his, his or her first attention would go, which point it would actually uh, take. And interesting enough with the secrets, it is not so much the eyes, which is mostly the focal point of a lot of imagery, but in this case, of course, the eyes are closed. Now, if you take that into a court and put it into the algorithms, the algorithms will go to several layers of signifiers and meanings, and that also goes for the closed lips. So, therefore, the image produces an image with light lit, is lit up in the middle of the face. That actually is an indication, and the indication that comes back in terms of a signifier is that it's inward looking. So that already emphasizes the ambiguity within the image, which was also the aim of my image in a sense, and therefore also the title. So that was kind of astonishing to see that. What I was also interested in is to see how far you can go with this type of research. Uh, what Luc and I were doing, of course, is we are still controlling the, Im the input. We, we are, as, as human beings, in a sense, we are controlling the artificial intelligence in terms of what we consider being valid or, let's say, less superficial or uh, essential or not. The other request would be, of course, which is broader and even I mean, yet another element is for what would happen if we wouldn't. So there is, in my account, also still 
the, 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 the question mark, what would the aberration be of the situation, which is a bit more a dystopian uh, idea of working with artificial intelligence. I mean, that's also, of course, in the situation. When would, for example, artificial intelligence, in terms of creativity, be the end of creativity? So this is, this is, these are quite, I mean, important, because this is just the beginning. I mean, first of all, I think in a society we live in, a lot of this artificial intelligence is used as face recognition, as elements that are actually derived from, it can, it can be used in a very, very, I mean, effective way in terms of healthcare. It can, I mean, it can, all these elements will be applications. But once we go over the element of the application is where the artificial intelligence starts to think. And I gave the example of the, uh, there is one that doesn't fall in now, right now, chess program, which is so extremely good that it actually competes with another chess program and defeats it. And this is based upon how it itself learned to assess uh, the rules of the game without having all the data uh, of games that have been played, for example. So it is an immediate assessment. It's a very dangerous proposition I'm making here, but it's one that becomes, I think, in the far, I mean, in, in, in the, f I mean, in the future, could become something you have to weaponize yourself against in terms of exactly this element of creativity. So it is with an element of skepticism that I actually entered this uh, whole inquest and this whole research, but also with an element of openness, because I mean, the idea is just to see, that's the, the idea of research. The research is never conclusive. I also think that, I mean, I was also from the idea that one should never uh, put up a fight with new media because it's something you can never win. I mean, so it's much more interesting to incorporate them into your toolbox in order to work from, which is always my understanding. That's how I work with using Polaroids, uh, uh, working with the web, uh, I mean, all those elements, just to, and, and also because you, you live in your own contemporarity of which you cannot get away. I mean, you cannot sort of like be non-negotiable against it. And so you have to sort of deal with it in a sense. Already in terms of light and contrast, that's something which you can see because the contrast in my work is different than the contrast in, let's say, paintings from the 19th century. So the element of the digitalized age or image that creeps in to the, the, the world of images that you make. And also the process that I make, which is based upon referential imagery, not all the time, but most of the time, is a choice. It was always the choice to work from a deliberate point of view, which I called in a very uh, early stage, when I was 18, and had to recognize that painting was, uh, in a sense, something that was, uh, yeah, an anachronism, which it always is. That means that it works through time, with time, and actually works with an element of belatedness. And therefore, I came up with the idea, in order to be able to paint again, with an idea which I called the authentic forgery. So from the very start, there was this idea that the image is not what it seems to be. So there is already a sort of ambiguity based from the very start in the imagery that travels, in a sense, in terms of its signifier. And I wanted to see how that would actually respond to this artificial intelligence and how, and, and that, that's still a question mark. Going back to the particular image that is actually sort of shown and researched uh, in this particular presentation, it's a painting from 1990 that I painted. 
and it was based upon my fascination with one particular uh, individual, which was Albert Speer, who was, of course, an interesting person because he was an architect, but he also became the Minister of Defence, prolonged the, the war because of his, he was very efficient in it. He was also somebody who knew, actually, what happened in the labour and the concentration camps. And he was one of the Nazi, uh, yeah, important Nazi functionaries that survived the war, basically. So he was lucky, in a sense. And he was also opportunistic, because the whole dependency of the Nazi party and, of course, the whole structure enabled him in a sort of megalomaniac endeavor, which, of which nothing and not a lot actually was really actually uh, materialized. My particular point with this specific image was, first I tried to paint the face of uh, Albert Speer, which I found too literal, too one-on-one. -on -one. So I, in the process of painting, and this happened uh, in the matter of, let's say, 30 seconds, I erased the image. The image became a sort of image that is uh, a general image, like you could have like uh, a mannequin. You, it, it, it looks like something like a, a shop window doll, in a sense. But one particular change is that the eyes are closed. That was a particular decision, which has also been taken up and recognized by the algorithm, because there is a mentioning and there is data where there is talk about what semantically also closed eyelids could mean, or what the idea of uh, secrets could mean in terms of hiding something. That was also my particular point. The other thing is uh, the cutout of the original image, because on the original image, uh, or the source image, you will see, of course, the, the, the arm bent, the, the, the arm, uh, on the arm, you will see the swastika, which I didn't want to show because I wanted to actually, as I said, be less visceral, less one-on-one. -on -one. And so the only indication of the uniform is actually how actually there is one white line that is uh, on, on the, uh, the borders of the, of the, of the it, lapels of the uniform that give you the idea of a uniformed element. And of course, there is, the cult there is the color. The coloring is important. In my particular case, and this has always been a little bit a sort of principle, is that I, uh, I don't go for harsh uh, colors. I go for actually uh, a sort of subdued color, uh, but, but a tonality, in a sense. And tonality, of course, is an indication of heat or there is an indication of temperature, in a sense. And in this sense, the temperature should be something that is actually initially indicator of the detachment of the imagery also, so that you know that it's not a real image. You're looking at an image of an image, in a sense. And that is also something that the algorithm sort of captured, in a way. And then there is the difference between the source material and the real image, because there is a difference. I mean, they don't line up exactly. And this is also something that the algorithms, of course, immediately spotted. And from there on, also inconsistencies cropped up in what that could mean for the data or the signifier. So, and then from there, of course, you go to the bigger construction, is, which is, of course, the history, the, which goes to where it was shown. I mean, all those data, you can all come together, and then you evolve to different knowledge platforms, and you can actually go on and on and on and on, in a sense. The point is uh, to see where, where, where you then actually decide to focus upon. I mean, that is, and still the remaining point is, of course, how it retrieves itself back to the specific visual. I'm curious to see how, in accordance with the project that we are doing, how far you can go in this situation. On the one hand, that could be a danger proposition because it could be the end of creativity in a sense. Or it could be 
the opposite. I mean, that is, depends on how, of course, you also control it, in a sense. <laughs>